started. Uh, welcome everyone. My name is Tim Kiefer. I'm a professor here in the uh, Life Sciences Institute and I organized a course this year on regenerative medicine and stem cells. Uh, what does the future hold? Uh, and that was supported by uh, Killam. Um, and that financial support allowed us to bring in some uh, worldwide experts in stem cells and regenerative medicine uh, and have them come and uh, participate in the course, uh, give a lecture to students, and also give a lecture in the evening open to the public, um, such as the one tonight. Um, uh, so tonight, uh, we're really excited to hear from uh, Professor Michael Rudnicki, um, who comes from Ottawa. Uh, you can see a number of letters after his name. I'm curious to poll people if, I'm sure you know what a PhD is, but how many know what the OC stands for? Sorry? Yes. Officer of the Order of Canada. So I actually well, didn't know that um, <coughs> until seeing it um, after Michael's name, and a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. Uh, so these are a few of his many accolades. He's also a holder of a, a very prestigious Tier 1 Canada Research Chair. Uh, he's a professor at the University of uh, Ottawa and also a senior scientist uh, at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute and director of regenerative, regenerative medicine there. Um, and uh, he's really an outstanding scientist. I was telling the class today how many publications he has, uh, this metric called an H index, which tells how many times his papers have been cited, is like through the roof. He's really an, an exceptional scientist, so we're really fortunate to have him. Um, he's really a pioneer and leader in regenerative medicine, a thought leader, internationally recognized thought leader. Um, and really has uh, told, uh, uh, educated us about muscle development and muscle regeneration. So he identified muscle stem cells, uh, characterized them, and, and his work is really leading to new innovative strategies using molecular biology approaches and stem cell approaches to hopefully treat muscular dystrophy and other uh, neuromuscular uh, disorders, and I hope he'll uh, tell us a little bit about that today. And also not on here, I should mention that he's the uh, CEO and scientific director of the Stem Cell Network, uh, and he's been doing this for about 12 years. This is a Canadian network of, I think, probably about 150 Canadian scientists doing stem cell research, uh, and he plays a critical role in bringing everybody together, mobilizing everybody, and really making uh, Canada a powerhouse when it comes to stem cell and regenerative medicine, and he's been leading that initiative for, uh, as I mentioned, about 12 years, so we're really fortunate to have him here. I think he'll touch on that a little bit in his talk, um, and also just tell us in general about regenerative medicine and the potential of stem cells. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Professor Renicki. Is my microphone on? Um, I think so. Sounds good, right? Well, you know, what they do is they take me out for dinner, feed me too much food, we drank too much wine, and now I have to give a talk. So, which, uh, so I'd like to thank Tim for his very kind invitation to come out to uh, Vancouver again and for organizing the weather, um, which, which also has, has been beautiful. It's always like this. It hardly ever rains in Vancouver, I gather, as Tim has been telling me. So it's a real pleasure to be back here again and see so many uh, uh, good friends. So uh, my talk tonight is um, a, a lay talk. It's not uh, going to be scientifically over the top, I hope, or overly detailed. It's I'm going to give you a primer on stem cells, what is a stem cell, how they can be used, the different types of stem cells. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, my work. Uh, uh, won't be a deep dive, but just give you a little bit of a flavor about work we do in, in, in uh, my lab. And I'll close with a an overview of the, the stem cell network and, uh, and what it's accomplished uh, over the years. And then we're going to have an exam. <laughs> so I, I hope you, uh, it's multiple choice. Uh, if you pick B, you'll probably pass. <laughs> so, so just pick B. You'll be fine. Okay, so let's get going. So I, I want to begin by saying that uh, stem cell research, uh, the depth and breadth of stem cell research here in Canada is something that most Canadians don't appreciate, um, that we are in fact world leaders in this space. Uh, uh, 
I don't have too many clickers. These two gentlemen, uh, Ernst McCullough and James Till, uh, who uh, Connie trained with, uh, Connie Hughes over there, uh, were the first to demonstrate that stem cells actually exist. This was a discovery that, that was in the early 1960s. They used actually what we now we would view as very uh, simple equipment and simple, simple uh, uh, well, like, uh, techniques to uh, conduct elegant experiments that really defined uh, uh, many of the issues and problems that define the, the, the vocabulary that we use to this day uh, in, in conducting stem cell research. And they, they, they should have got the Nobel Prize for this work, but uh, we Canadians tend not to pat ourselves on the back a whole lot. So stem cells were discovered here in Canada. And uh, to this day, uh, there are more Canadian uh, scientists working in this space than, than in many other jurisdictions, uh, like uh, you know in California, for example, which is a similar population. We we publish more papers, we have more patents, we punch well above our weight in this space. And there's been many, many contributions over the years in the stem cell space from Canadian scientists. And if one looks in, in many different areas, uh, you'll find that there's a Canadian who's like in the top 10% of, the, of that particular stem cell field. And uh, although you can't read any of this, there are many, there's many Canadians shown here. Uh, there's Sam Weiss, uh, Frieda Miller, and et cetera, uh, John Dick, uh, who have each in turn made these really incredibly important contributions that have turned the field around and have moved it forward to a level that uh, hasn't been reached before. So Canadians really lead in stem cell research. And I think that's something that Canadians really need to take on board and something that they need to be proud of. Uh, we need to celebrate our own more. So what is a stem cell? Uh, well, in, in a simple way, there's, there's two, two um, uh, behaviors that are considered uh, uh, important parts of defining what a stem cell is. One is that they can divide, and they can divide indefinitely to make copies of themselves. So they last throughout your life. Uh, secondly, they give rise to specialized or differentiated cell types that build up our body. And there's well over 200 different cell types that make up our body. Um, now, we are now at this point by 2018 arriving at a, at a molecular understanding of what is stemness and, and the mechanisms that define stemness. But this is where we began with uh, in, in our understanding of what a stem cell is. And there are a, a tiny subset of the cells that are within our body, but uh, within our body, but these cells actually build the entire body. Uh, so this is a, a, a diagram showing you development starting with a fertilized egg. It's called a zygote. Uh, Within a week in humans, it becomes a, a blastocyst. This is a tiny little speck that you'd be, barely be able to see, smaller than a head of a pin. You couldn't see it with your, your bare eye. You need a microscope. Um, this is a single cell that's been fertilized. It divides uh, to make uh, 64 or 72 or more cells. It looks like a little soccer ball. Um, uh, the, the, uh, the cells on, uh, that's hollow, the cells on the outside go on to make the the, uh, the non-embryo stuff uh, in the placenta and the membranes. Uh, this little thickening to one side, a little a group of, of uh, uh, six or so cells is called the inner cell mass. That gives rise to the embryo proper. Uh, those are embryonic stem cells in that little layer there. The embryonic stem cells go on and divide, and as the embryo is built and the different layers are elaborated, they become more and more specialized. Uh, and uh, so it's kind of like a, a baby. A baby, uh, when born, can become absolutely anything in life. They can become uh, a rocket scientist, or they can become a painter, an author, whatever. All the possibilities are potentially open to them. But as you go on through life, you go to school, you make choices, you end up uh, as a biologist or an engineer or uh, because of your education. If you're in the engineering program, you can become four types of engineers maybe, and you become more and more specialized. And that's what happens to stem cells as they go through, as the embryo is being built, they become more and more specialized, and they become specialized to build certain cell types. For example, they become specialized to make the cell types that are in your brain. Uh, neurons, glia, and astroglia, or they're specialized to make the, the cells that are in your blood system, or in skeletal muscle, or skin, and so on. Uh, so uh, this is how the body is built. Uh, well, uh, real development is, uh, the real processes that build embryo aren't quite this simple. Uh, it's a little more complicated, and there's a lot more choices to be made. 
uh, uh, the numbers of differentiated cells, the bricks that our house is built of, our body is built of, are thought to be over 200. Uh, in the least, last few years, the, there's been experiments where they've been analyzing uh, the genes that are expressed in individual cells, and that, that heterogeneity now is thought to be a lot more. Uh, and so that number isn't clear where that will end. But, uh, and there's also different flavors of differentiated cell type. Um, so there's not a single type of neuron. There's many different types of differentiated neurons and, and so on. Uh, so there's this real tree of specialization that occurs. But this is all driven by starting with embryonic stem cells, we can make absolutely everything, to more specialized stem cells as we, as we progress through the developmental process. And the whole idea, this is a mouse embryo, not a human, uh, is to build the body, and by this early stage during embryonic development, all the organs have been laid out, and the differentiated cells are being generated, and that embryo is then grown. So, uh, which stem cells have the most potential to become everything? It's embryonic stem cells. And so, what is an embryonic stem cell? Well, I think most of us should be familiar with this biology here. Is that right, Langton? <laughs> Don't forget there's an exam, so stay awake. So uh, we have a sperm made by boys and eggs that are made by girls. And um, uh, uh, yeah, there's even a little bit of animation. We have fertilization. <laughs> and uh, that becomes the zygote after fertilization. Uh, that after, uh, it's about five days in mice, about a week in humans, forms the blastocyst, our little soccer ball. Uh, that thickening to one side, I don't know, 10, 12 cells, it's the so-called inner cell mass. Uh, what one does to make an embryonic stem cell line is isolate these blastocyst stage embryos. And uh, in Canada and other jurisdictions, these are embryos that would are uh, left over in IVF clinics and are going to be destroyed and not used. It's a highly regulated process. Uh, and you put that into a petri dish, and it looks like a fried egg. It goes down, attaches to the plate, and spreads. And the inner cell mass is, is the yolk, and the rest of the embryo is, uh, uh, forms the white of the egg. And you go in, and you pull out these, the inner cell mass, disperse them, and, uh, and they grow out as individual cells and form colonies and can be passaged continuously. And really, what's quite marvelous about embryonic stem cells is that these are immortal they will grow forever. And they have many properties that are cancer-like. If you transplant plant those cells into your body, they'll form a tumor called a teratocarcinoma that'll metastasize and kill you. Uh, that's an embryonic stem cell. However, in other contexts, they behave quite normally. So uh, these are pluripotent stem cells. Uh, they can make absolutely every body, a cell type in your body. And we know that because we can take the cells from the tissue culture put them into a small glass pipette and introduce them into the blastocyst, the space inside of, of another blastocyst, put them back into a, a mother mouse and have babies born who are chimeras, who are mixtures of cells from the inner cell mass and the cells that you injected. And those embryonic stem cells will give rise to cells throughout that body uh, everywhere, including the so-called germ cells, which are located under the tail there, that make sperm and ova. And uh, this mice is tumor-free and will be for its entire life. These cells, in the context of embryonic development, will behave perfectly normally. And this is, these are mouse embryonic stem cells. Uh, they look like clumps, these little shiny bunches that have uh, eight or so cells or less cells in these clumps growing in a petri plate. These other cells growing around them, we call them feeder cells. They're just there to keep them comfortable. Uh, they are uh, not embryonic stem cells. Yeah, I even have arrows to point to them. And so this is a little movie. Hopefully, hopefully this will work. No, it doesn't. I mean, I can do this on my screen. Of an injection experiment. I like to show this because I did so many of these as a postdoc. So uh, is this going to work? Yeah, here we go. So we used to inject, uh, I don't know, 80 to 100 embryos in a session. Uh, one's working on a microscope, um, going around the plate, picking up embryonic stem cells with the, the, the glass pipette that we made in a little microforge, made them ourselves, 
pick up the cells. Then you get, this is the holding pipette, which you then grab the blastocyst stage embryo. Here it is. The inner cell mass is located over here. Here comes the needle. It's going to puncture the wall of the blastocyst. Bang, and deliver the cells. So you do that 80 times, 80 different embryos. You can't drink too much coffee, believe me. Uh, <laughs> you need steady hands, and then one has to transplant them into the uterus of uh, the recipient mice, and then uh, uh, wait uh, three weeks for the mice to be born, and you have a chimeric mouse. Now normally laboratory mice are all black, or all brown, or all white. This chimeric mouse you see has stripes of different colors. So the host blastocyst here was a black mouse, and the cells that we injected were this brown color. And so this is a nice chimeric mouse. Uh, this is the one I made when I was a postdoctoral fellow, and this, 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 uh, this was a male mice, so if you looked under his tail, you'd see he had um, brown boy bits. And when we bred him, uh, his offspring would be uh, all brown and they would be derived entirely from the embryonic stem cells that we've been growing in culture. The blastocyst arrived and embryonic stem cells arrived. Now, this technology, uh, when I began working as, as a postdoctoral fellow, was, was going to, it was just coming into the labs uh, and it totally revolutionized our use of genetic tools to study disease. So these these embryonic stem cells, these mice embryonic stem cells, we could engineer to lack specific genes. Any gene we want, we could take out uh, using a technique called homologous recombination, uh, and we could build mice that were models for human genetic diseases, for example. Or we could reset um, uh, cancer biology by adding and removing genes, mutating genes, and so on. So this is, was, is an incredible tool using mice uh, to study how genes regulate all kinds of different processes and really totally transformed our, our, the study of molecular genetics and, and cell function. A uh, fabulous tool. Now, embryonic stem cells, uh, we can also control their differentiation. In the petri dish, not in the, in the mouse um, uh, or uh, in, in humans, we can develop techniques to control the differentiation to manufacture particular cell types. And Tim here has uh, developed the technology using human embryonic stem cells, which, which I'll get to in a minute, uh, to generate the, the cells that produce insulin in the pancreas. And these are now being used in clinical trials to reverse type 1 diabetes. Uh, so th there's a huge potential for making use of embryonic stem cells to generate uh, uh, cells for transplantation to treat a whole variety of, of different uh, uh, diseases. Uh, human embryonic stem cells were first described now a long time ago in 1998 by uh, Jamie Thompson, and here they are, and, uh, and they, they work just like mouse embryonic stem cells. Uh, we can engineer them, we can modify them, uh, we can use them to, to generate differentiated cell types. We don't make chimeric people and breed them, though, that, that's, uh, although that is technically possible. Um, we don't want to do that, do we? And so this was really a revolution, uh, a real breakthrough that, um, uh, again, uh, moved the science forward in a really significant way. At the time, though, it was very controversial and generated a lot of press about uh, the scary parts of, of, of stem cell research. Uh, and there was also a lot of pushback uh, 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 among uh, the regulatory people, particularly here in Canada, who were uh, very concerned about the ethical implications of working with embryonic stem cells. Um, so these, these do provide an endless source of stem cells. Uh, they are being, being used in multiple clinical trials, also generating cells for um, uh, transplanting into the eye. That's uh, also the, the trial Tim's involved with. Um, there were uh, uh, and, uh, concerns around the safety of these because they can, you know, if you're transplanting cells and, and uh, one or a few of them remain embryonic stem cells, they could form a tumor. So one has to have the, the differentiation conditions, the process that you use to generate the, the cell you want has to get rid of all the embryonic stem cells. 
Uh, there's also concerns about immune rejection, how to do immune matching and so on. It's like any organ transplantation, you need to match it to the person. And there's the concerns around the, the ethical use of, of human embryos. You know, for, in order to uh, match every possible uh, a recipient, you'd need hundreds and hundreds of, of, of donor cell lines, and even then it's not technically feasible to have every possible combination, uh, so it wouldn't be um, uh, uh, rejected by the immune system. Um, but to get a match, you'd need several hundred possible donors, and there's concerns that it would be um, require many, many human embryos to generate these, these lines. Well, that has turned out actually not to be a, a, um, a concern. Here in Canada, uh, I think we've derived uh, over many years five cell lines, and that's more than sufficient for the research purposes. Uh, but I think the, the major reason of that is that there's been a real, a, another uh, leap in the technology. Um, in 2006, Shinya Yamanaka made another critical contribution that was mind-blowing when, when uh, the papers came out that, that, uh, that this could be done. And now we all accept it as, as a fact, but it totally transformed uh, how we think about um, uh, cell identity and how stable it is and how easy it is to, to change that. So what he found was that uh, you can take uh, a non-stem cell in the body, like a, uh, a skin cell, a skin, or a skin fibroblast, you could express four different genes in it. These genes are found in embryonic stem cells uh, and define the stem cell identity. And he can transform those, uh, a subset of those cells into what look just like, and they're identical to, embryonic stem cells. Uh, these are called induced pluripotent stem cells, or IPSC. So this is an incredible result that you can take a, a totally uninteresting cell and make it into an interesting cell, in this case, uh, an embryonic stem cell. And if you compare them, they, they really are very, very identical, uh, if not identical. And these cells can be used in the, in the same way as, as embryonic stem cells and make whatever you want from them, but these are patient-specific stem cells. So that means anyone here in this room can have a, uh, an embryonic stem cell-like cell and an iPSC cell derived, that's yours and yours alone, that could be used therapeutically for treating you or for diagnosing diseases or for doing research about that particular set of genes that you have. So really a fabulous uh, contribution, uh, which he got the Nobel Prize for, a paradigm-shifting contribution. Um, so these, you know, really are uh, science fiction become reality. They're uh, easy to derive, and they've developed now new techniques for this reprogramming. It's called reprogramming involving chemicals, and it's relatively facile. You can buy a kit to do that. Uh, uh, so there, there really there's no ethical issues around derivation of these cells. Um, you can do tissue matching. You can make cells that uh, are from uh, patients with genetic diseases. Um, and you can just study these diseases in a dish, and you can use them for screening of new therapies, and these are also in, in clinical trials in a variety of, of different places. I mentioned earlier there's also stem cells in adults, and most organs will have uh, different stem cells populations, not all. The heart is an exception, it doesn't have a population of stem cells. Um, but, uh, for example, uh, these are the uh, uh, this, the stem cells that make the blood system, which were discovered here in Canada, have been very well studied and we understand uh, their function. Um, uh, here's our stem cell way up at the top, and these are all the, the, the differentiated cells that make up your blood. Uh, and uh, in mice, critical experiments have been done to demonstrate that a mouse who's had um, a treatment to destroy their own blood-making cells, you can transplant a single stem cell into them and it'll rebuild their entire blood-making system. Really fabulous. Right, Connie? Connie works on blood stem cells. I think she did a few of those experiments, too. Uh, here's another example of uh, stem cells in the brain. Here's our neural stem cell. It gives rise to uh, what's called a progenitor cell or a, a, an amplifying cell uh, that then makes the three types of cells that make up our brain. Uh, the neurons that do the thinking, uh, and the astrocytes and the oligodendrocytes, which are uh, not just the star from packing in the brain, but uh, uh, help contribute to brain function. And again, this is just examples from, from two tissue types. We have stem cells in, in uh, most of our organs throughout our body. 
Uh, and they, they function throughout life uh, to uh, regenerate, well, first of all, to grow you uh, when you're a, a, a baby and a kid, and also to repair damaged tissue. Um, as we age, the function of stem cells declines, their number declines, and they're not as regenerative, um, uh, but they are there throughout life. So we have this hierarchy of stem cells. Embryonic stem cells that can make all the cell types within the body, and adult stem cells have a restricted potential. So just like a baby versus a kid at university who's specialized in terms of what they can be when they grow up. So how can these cells be used um, uh, uh, therapeutically? Um, so a, a big area of interest, of course, is transplantation of stem cells. And, and uh, uh, this has been going now in, with bone marrow for over 40 years in the clinic where, where uh, stem cells are either mobilized to the peripheral blood or, or taken from uh, marrow and then transplanted into a patient who's, who's received a, a treatment to wipe out their own bone marrow and they replace um, the, the blood making cells in the patient, especially if they have leukemia or, or other cancers of the blood, uh, to put in a healthy bone marrow blood making system. Uh, the other way to go uh, is to isolate our stem cells. Uh, we can expand them in a bioreactor and then transplant them. Uh, a nice example has actually been developed this technology here in Canada with uh, Guy Savageau, uh, uh, working with Peter Zanstra, who's now here at UBC, have developed using a small molecule and a bioreactor the ability to do this with cord blood stem cells. Cord blood stem cells, those that come from the umbilical cord uh, from um, uh, newborn infants, um, there's not enough cells in there to transplant a grown-up. You have to use multiple cords, two uh, typically, and, uh, and that can be difficult for people who are, um, in Canada we have uh, a lot of interesting uh, genotypes from all over the world and it can be difficult to match some of these. Uh, and so if, if they can find a single donor cord now, uh, they can isolate these uh, hematopoietic stem cells, the blood-making stem cells, from the cord, uh, expand them in a bioreactor with a small molecule, we get a 30-fold expansion of those stem cells, and then have more than enough to transplant into these patients. And that's technology developed here in Canada. Um, another way to do this, another application for cell therapy, and this is what Tim is doing, is to take your uh, uh, hematopoietic stem cell, I, uh, I grow them up, differentiate them into, for example, insulin expressing uh, uh, cells that can then be transplanted into the patient, in the case of Tim, they're in little tea bags, um, uh, to restore insulin production in patients with type 1 diabetes. Uh, similar sorts of approach, approaches have been tried in recent history uh, for treating spinal cord injury. Um, uh, there's also uh, clinical trials, I believe, with uh, uh, retinal cells uh, going on in uh, Japan, I think. So you can differentiate the cells first prior to transplantation. Uh, you can also modify these cells. You can introduce genes, and also uh, there's something called CRISPR-Cas that allows you to genetically edit the genome. Yes, science fiction is here. So the technology exists to change individual bases and nucleotides in genes to correct genetic mutations or alter the behavior of genes uh, for the, to alter their functionality. A uh, nice example of that, and these are in clinical trials, is the so-called CAR-T cell therapy. Uh, and uh, there are uh, companies that are uh, using this approach to generate CAR T cells that have genetic modifications that enhance their activity to treat cancer patients. Uh, I think, uh, so that's cell therapy. Uh, another approach is actually to mobilize the stem cells that you have in your body already. Uh, and this is a, an area that I'm interested in, uh, so that's why I'm gonna talk about it. But one can um, uh, be given the knowledge we have on the molecular mechanisms controlling stem cell function can identify targets and develop specific drugs to alter the behavior of stem cells that are already in the body, uh, uh, stimulating their migration, perhaps their uh, self renewal and expansion, controlling their differentiation, and do this in a tissue specific way. So one can develop pills that uh, stimulate regeneration uh, and correct 
disease deficiencies by enhancing the regenerative processes. And my lab is trying to work towards that in, in the, the muscle context. Uh, so what can we also use iPSC for? Well, this is an example uh, of a, a progeria patient. These are uh, patients that have accelerated aging. You've probably seen photographs of these little eight-year-olds that look like they're 80. It's a really tragic, awful disease. Um, uh, I have uh, colleagues in Ottawa who have derived iPSC for these patients, so they, they, they have the same genes mutated as the patient. Uh, they've differentiated them into vascular smooth muscle, which is particularly effective in these patients, and then screened drug libraries for compounds that reverse that effect. And they, they're testing those drugs in the, in the, the mouse models of, of these progeria patients that, that has the same mutation, and they've identified drugs that appear to slow the, that aging process. Uh, this has also been done with other genetic diseases like SMA, uh, spinal motor neuron atrophy, uh, where they differentiated them into neurons. This is work done by Lee Rubin in Harvard. Uh, and found drugs that prevented uh, cell death. And then in the mouse model, we're able to prevent uh, the, the loss of, the, of these motor neurons and, and are uh, now trying to move this towards uh, human trials, which has, uh, is always difficult and complicated to do. So you really can have the potential of iPSC for developing um, personalized medicine approaches that are specific to these genetic diseases. So it's really quite remarkable. Um, another Canadian contribution is uh, cancer stem cells. So uh, this isn't, doesn't, isn't relevant for all cancers, uh, but uh, uh, for, for many cancers, uh, there is a, what's called a tumor initiating, possibly a stem cell that is implicated in the disease. And typically, all of our current treatments um, um, target the bulk cells not the stem cell of the tumor, so they come back. So the, the tumor shrinks when you, when you treat with, with agents that kill cells that are dividing, but it, it, uh, the, the stem cell is not affected, and so the, the tumor comes back. So the, the, the insight was that these, these tumors that have a stem cell population, you need to develop drugs that target the stem cell, and then the, the tumor can no longer be sustained, and it's lost and, the, and, and is removed. And, uh, it was a Canadian scientist, John Dick, who uh, really was the uh, thought leader and uh, the scientist who, who led the charge, I think, in developing this concept, although he'll deny that. Uh, very modest guy. Uh, and this is a, a project that was initiated with the Stem Cell Network many years ago, um, but really, I think, made some key contributions. Uh, they took uh, uh, normal stem cells, in this case, they were neural stem cells, uh, or, or tumor-derived stem cells and did these screens for compounds uh, that would um, inhibit the proliferation specifically of the, of the tumor-initiating cell or the cancer stem cell, and they had a, a large number of hits, and this work has now moved into a, a variety of clinical trials. I think there's at least five multi-center clinical trials uh, underway right now that, that came directly out of these sorts of screens, uh, targeting the, the tumor-initiating or, or, or tumor stem cell. Um, and this is all done here in Canada. So we now have a, uh, a workable regulatory framework in Canada. It was actually rather uh, slow to get uh, put into uh, law, and it really delayed uh, the field of, in the embryonic stem cell space for, for a number of years. The law was passed in, in uh, Bill C-6 in March of 2004. It was really designed initially to regulate the activities of IVF clinics, um, but uh, and as, as an extension, it regulates the condition in which embryos may be donated for stem cell research, uh, and uh, has some pretty restrictive provisions around that, uh, which perhaps we can discuss in a minute, but it's a workable framework. Um, but you know, Canada is, is, is well-educated, largely secular, but we are, in terms of uh, the, the regulations around embryonic stem cell research, up there with um, uh, countries that have a uh, religious basis for um, uh, being against embryonic stem cell research, uh, like Ireland, for example, or, or Italy. Um, uh, in terms of secular 
uh, uh, well-educated countries like the United States. <laughs> Maybe that's a <laughs> misstatement. Uh, so in the United States, it's the Wild West. Everything goes. Uh, it's not regulated. Uh, the NIH will fund it. Uh, and also the United Kingdom, a lot of this research is permissible with, with uh, a certificate from, from uh, uh, the minister or ministry. Um, but in Canada, they, they're very highly regu regulated. And I, I, uh, at the time when, when uh, um, this bill was being um, put together, it was very controversial. And one of the big heebie-jeebie things that was, there was hundreds of newspaper articles about this, was nuclear cloning and how frightful that was. So I'll just take a moment for fun to, to talk about nuclear cloning. I think it's probably time has passed on and people are less interested in this, in the controversial aspect, because we accept that stem cells are, are, are good. Uh, but anyhow, uh, so I want to talk about nuclear cloning and how that differs from nuclear transfer. Um, uh, nuclear cloning is in Dolly the sheep, production of stock animals. Uh, nuclear transfer is also called therapeutic cloning. Uh, I'll talk about cybids or, or three parent embryos. And uh, we already talked about induced pluripotent stem cells. So what's nuclear cloning? So basically, yeah, oh yeah. OK, here's Dolly the sheep. She was the first animal that was cloned. Um, I'm, I met her, I, the stuffed version of her in Edinburgh at the museum there. Um, uh, and uh, this was a, a very exciting, of course. Uh, this technology is wonderful for stock animals. If you have a prize bull or a racehorse, you can go back to that animal and have a, have a, have a, have a breeder to use and sell sperm from for forever. So there's a lot of cloning done for stock animals. But also, if you have a favorite pet, you can also have them cloned and have them come back too. So, uh, so what, yeah, what is nuclear cloning? Uh, yeah, I got cloned by mistake. Uh, but what, at the time, there was a lot of fear around cloning. Uh, remember the movie Boys from Brazil? Uh, uh, there was also, uh, following that, the Raelians claimed to have cloned a human, and uh, poop hit the fan. Everyone panicked. Uh, these are the same people who believe in flying saucers and aliens. Uh, and aliens is probably right, but I don't know about flying saucers, but it's an interesting religion in, based in Quebec who claimed to have cloned somebody and held a press conference. Uh, so there was a lot of fear in, 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 uh, in politicians, particularly, about nuclear cloning and how bad that was. Um, I want to point out that we, we have clones all around us. Uh, does anyone know an identical twin? Is there an identical twin here? Just me. I'm an identical twin. So this is me and my brother. We're pretty cute, eh? You see we have a full head of hair. Uh, so my brother Stephen. I don't remember which was which. I think that might be me there, but I'm not sure. Anyhow, cloning, you know, clones exist in nature, right? So it's not very fearful. Um, uh, and uh, and they're so lovable too. Okay, so that is nuclear cloning. So let's take uh, a, a cell from our body. In this case, it's a cell from the tip, of, let's say, of the tip of my nose, a skin cell. And here's our egg. Uh, one goes in with pulled glass pipettes. You pull out the nuclei from those two cells. The nucleus contains all the chrom chromosomes and the genetic material. Uh, that define cell, uh, cell identity and is identical with the rest of the cells of your body. Um, and uh, you throw away the egg nucleus and you take your skin cell nucleus from the tip of my nose and you drop it in. And this has actually been a, a very inefficient process uh, in uh, uh, even with stock animals uh, and um, uh, has been very difficult to do in humans. So. Anyhow, uh, you let it develop to the last stage, and then you, oh, there we go. You have a clone, mini-me. Uh, and um, uh, this, though, uh, is illegal in Canada. Uh, it's a $10,000 fine, 10 years in jail, if a scientist does that. They haven't figured out, though, if you go out to another country uh, uh, and do it and come back, like Britain, where it's legal, or the United States was legal. If you come back to Canada, they put you in jail. There's no one's been charged at this point. But this law is on the books. Um, this is an example of uh, where there was an attempt to uh, regulate the specific experiments were done. And 
uh, previously in history, if I may be a little histrionic, excuse the pun, that uh, uh, in, in under Stalin, um, uh, genetics was made illegal and you went to the gulag for doing specific experiments. Uh, we typically in democracies, which are mostly secular and, and well-educated, we do not outlaw specific experiments. You uh, don't do go to jail for uh, doing an experiment involving plutonium. You have to have the permission to do that experiment. So it's regulated um, by regulatory bodies, not specific experiments. We don't do that in democracies. But this is an example for the first time where, where specific experiments were made illegal because of the fear of the boys from Brazil. So it was overkill. Uh, anyhow, by 2018, they can now do monkeys. It's never been done uh, to make living humans at this point, even though there's been several claims to do so. Um, so, but monkeys can be done. There's Dolly, my friend, Dolly the sheep. And, but this technology though does have application. This procedure is illegal in Canada, 10 years in jail, $10,000 fine. But in Britain it's being used as a, as a method for assisted reproduction for uh, parents who have particular genetic conditions. Um, these are people who carry diseases uh, in, uh, genetic diseases essentially in their what are called mitochondria, which are little factories in the cell that make energy. And so the, the process is to provide healthy mitochondria to the donor egg. So the one has three parents, um, a one who supplies the cytoplasm with the, with the uh, uh, I'm sorry, this is the, the patient with the, 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 the faulty mitochondrial DNA. Uh, we have a, um, a parent with the healthy mitochondrial DNA and that nuclei is transferred into the healthy mitochondria and then the sperm comes to the father. So we have three different parents. And this has now been done in the United Kingdom, allowing these pa patients to, to be able to have children. It's a complicated method involving nuclear transfer, cytoplasmic transfer, three different parents, but by God it works and allows these people to have, have children. Totally illegal in Canada. Um, so I'll close this part by saying that, that you know, we're really at a tipping point where, where uh, regenerative medicine, uh, stem cell research uh, has paved the way for, for new treatments to, to enter the clinic and we're seeing more and more clinical trials involving stem cells. Um, uh, and I think within our children's lifetime we're going to see a real transformation of the way medicine is practiced without doubt. Um, in Canada, we know of, a, of, a, of over 50 clinical trials in the regenerative medicine space that are, that are either in the clinic or on their way to the clinic, and there's many more going on internationally. But I think uh, you really need to be aware, beware of the hype. Uh, uh, there's a speaker coming, uh, I'm not sure when, Tim Caulfield? In, uh, March. in March, uh, who has, um, uh, he's a lawyer uh, 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 interested in, in many aspects of stem cell research, and he's conducted research into these uh, clinics popping up everywhere that, that purport to use stem cells to cure basically every disease you, you could imagine. Uh, and uh, these are unproven therapies and unproven use of stem cells. In fact, many of these clinics aren't using stem cells. They're using other stuff that they've collected from, let's say, from fat cells, and they call them fat stem cells, as, but they're not. They're just the, the, the garbage that comes out of the tissue when you remove the, the fat cells, and uh, these are not regenerative techniques. And so basically, uh, there's many centers in the, in the U.S., and, uh, and every large city in Canada has a, a clinic or two that will inject these cells into your knee, and, and many of these clinics, there's a CBC show on the National uh, last month, I believe, or two months ago, many of these clinics that had the hidden camera on the reporter are claiming that this is, these are stem cells they're introducing and it's regenerative. It's not regenerative. It makes the knee feel better, but it's not restoring anything in the, in the knee. And so um, uh, when you see, uh, so be careful, caveat emptor, if it sounds too good to be true, it's too good to be true. There's a regulatory loophole where you, your own cells being put back into your body uh, is uh, they can get away with that for now. Uh, the FDA is working to change that in the U.S., but be very careful of the hype and, uh, and these uh, clinics that are selling snake oil. And Tim's going to talk a lot more about that. Okay, I'm going to talk briefly about my own research, which I'd like to talk 
all night about, of course. But I won't. I work in the area of, of uh, stem cells in skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle is our voluntary muscle. It's not your heart. It's not the, the muscle that uh, controls your bowel movements. It's our voluntary muscle uh, that allows us to walk around and do things. Um, the muscle is the largest organ in the body. Uh, it's composed of, of these long fibers that are a um, uh, full of nuclei formed by fusion of the progenitors, uh, and they can chain the proteins that, that are, are contractile. Uh, here's a cartoon showing a muscle fiber. There's, a, there's cells that are associated with these fibers called satellite cells, uh, and these cells, uh, uh, a subset of these cells are the stem cells of the muscle tissue, and in response to damage, hiking, uh, carrying your muscle, jogging, or um, just standing around, uh, uh, moving around, these cells will enter, uh, will begin dividing into the cell cycle, give rise to uh, amplifying cells and progenitors, uh, which will then go on to divide and then re repair the muscle. Uh, and, uh, and we've uh, spent many years uh, understanding the molecular mechanisms that control the function of these stem cells. Um, uh, a disease that we've been particularly interested in is Duchenne muscular dystrophy. It's a disease of skeletal muscle. This is a, 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 a considered a rare disease. It affects one in three and a half thousand male births. The reason why it affects primarily males is that it's, the gene is located on the X chromosome. Women have two X chromosomes, uh, and they would have to have both genes mutated in order to have the disease. Um, boys have an X and a Y chromosome. And so they only need one gene mutated to have the disease. So it's quite prevalent. It's the most prevalent type of muscular dystrophy. Uh, here's the gene involved. It's called dystrophin. Uh, it's part of a complex of proteins that sit on the cell surface of a, of a muscle fiber. Uh, and it, uh, without this complex, structural integrity is lost. And so that when the, when the movement occurs, the this, this cells are not kept in register, and it tears itself apart. Uh, and then the uh, outside uh, uh, leaks in, calcium comes into the cell, and kills the muscle fiber. Uh, and you have these recurring rounds of degeneration, and regeneration, and degeneration, and regeneration. And the entire muscle tissue becomes replaced with scar tissue and fat. And these boys die when well, they're in wheelchairs by age eight, and they're usually dead in the second, die in the second dead, uh, decade of life usually of respiratory failure, but also of heart failure. Um, the protein was not thought to be a feature of the, of the stem cell uh, because it wasn't present in the progenitors. And we made a discovery a few years ago that, in fact, it was. And it had a very important role in those stem cells. And um, in, in muscle, we have our, our satellite cell compartment. Those are the cells I showed you the cartoon of. A portion of, the stem, of those cells are stem cells. And these can go on and divide in different ways to give rise to progenitors that proliferate uh, numerous times before differentiating. And, uh, and this is a, an asymmetric stem cell division. Uh, in this case, the stem cell is divided and given rise to a daughter cell that's going to, has become uh, a committed cell that's going to go on and differentiate. And what we found is that this process of so-called asymmetric division is defective in these patients with um, uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And, uh, and don't forget there is an exam, so pay careful attention, Langton. Particularly Langton. OK, so here's our dystrophin gene. And what it does, it sets up one cortex of the dividing with cell that's just setting up to divide. Uh, and it, divi it defines the orientation of the cell. So for a stem cell to, to divide asymmetrically, it needs to understand where the, the, the ground is. It boots have to be on the ground, and it needs to know what the other cortex is, is at the other end, so that it can divide the cell in this orientation to give rise to a progenitor. Uh, this mechanism is lost in, in the absence of dystrophin, and these cells are lost in space. They don't know what is up or down. And this results in a loss of asymmetric and an and enhanced self renewal of the stem cell compartment. So you have too many stem cells and a reduced flux from the stem cell to the progenitor compartment. The ability to generate progenitors is, is down 
fivefold in these patients. And, uh, and, and our experiments suggest that, uh, that this uh, inability to generate progenitors efficiently significantly impacts to the progression of the dystrophic disease. If, um, uh, and uh, we've done this by modeling this in mice. Uh, so if we can um, repair and, and restore this balance, we believe we can develop a new treatment for the disease that will ameliorate the progression of the disease. It won't fix the genetic deficiency, but it will enhance the healing caused by the damage. Uh, and so towards that end, uh, it doesn't matter what the slide is, but what we're looking for are drugs that restore the balance uh, in, in this uh, cell division. And uh, we've made some uh, nice headway in this space, and, uh, and we have some candidates that we're following up. And so our hope is to use drugs to alter the decision making of stem cells to restore this reduced asymmetric division that is seen in these patients so that we can enhance the repair of the tissue with a pill. Okay, hey, I'm going to close. How am I doing for time, Tim? Uh, four okay, that, that, I'll, I'll uh, speak really, really quick. So I, I want uh, Tim asked me to close with a, with a brief description of the stem cell network. Uh, the imperative, I think, is obvious. Uh, there's an increasing burden of disease, and it's been estimated that the regenerative medicine uh, market for stem cell-based treatments and therapeutics is huge. So there's a ginormous economic uh, opportunity for Canada. This slide is what we show to government. Uh, but also, um, of course, uh, we believe you know, we've arrived at the tipping point and these treatments are going to be entering uh, the, the clinic a, a, at an uh, increased pace as we're coming and it's going to transform the practice of medicine. So uh, these are examples of, of some stem cell treatments of patients that, that have really um, um, uh, well, here's a leukemia patient with a bone marrow transplantation. Uh, this is a, uh, a re rebooting of the immune system to basically uh, reset the immune system so this patient no longer has multiple sclerosis. She went from being in a rehab center, uh, being spoon fed, being cared for, to uh, skiing, driving, working. That's the government's always wants to know that people are working and paying taxes. So she's paying taxes. Uh, here's another patient who was treated with uh, MSC to modulate the immune response to septic shock. This is a blood infection. 40% of patients with septic shock die in the ICU. Uh, and this uh, modulation uh, with these cells uh, enhances survival. And this is a clinical trial that's underway. So these are really transformative and impactful treatments that are coming. The Stem Cell Network is the only na uh, national funder for stem cell regenerative medicine research. It was established in 2001 under a program called the, the, the National Centers of Excellence, and we were funded in, the, in our first 14 years through that program. The last three years we've been funded outside of that program. Uh, and our mandate is to enable the translation of stem cell research into the clinical applications, commercial products, and policy. Uh, and, um, and we're really the voice of Canada on the global stage for, for stem cell research. Uh, so uh, the elements of our success, we really uh, accelerated the scientific uh, discovery and by uh, uh, funding across the pipeline enabled the translation of those discoveries into applications. Uh, and we do this by uh, creating a multidisciplinary a research and training environment uh, with a culture of collaboration and partnering. And I think this is something, an, another thing that Canadians really excel at is working uh, in a collaborative way, uh, pulling together uh, towards common objectives in, in a team-based approach. Um, in other jurisdictions, like south of the border, they compete with each other very well. Uh, uh, we, uh, our model is to work together to achieve those aims more quickly. And where we work in is in this, this so-called translational gap, the valley of death. Basic research is funded by the government. Uh, the, the clinical stuff is, com is usually funded by companies. And there's this space in between uh, where uh, stuff fails because there's no money to move it across this pipeline. So we, we fund the pipeline of research across the space. We have investigators across uh, Canada, over 150 research groups. We've trained uh, uh, over 5,000 FTEs over the years. And I, th I think we've had significant impacts on, on many people's um, uh, trainees' uh, careers by allowing them to uh, 
uh, be exposed uh, nationally and internationally to, to the best scientists working in the space. Um, we have uh, a many enhanced um, uh, training opportunities involving uh, workshops, uh, training around commercialization, and practical skills. And we offer over 200 training spots annually. That's a big part of what we do. Uh, we've also been involved in commercialization and, uh, and helping companies bring products to the clinic in small ways and in larger ways. I'll tell you about Exothera in a moment. A uh, small grant to uh, TRT allowed them to come up with a product that's being sold internationally. Uh, we've been involved with helping uh, these companies, not by granting the company's money, we're not allowed to do that, but by funding the science that then is taken up by these companies and moved forward. Uh, uh, one of our big success stories is, is work by, uh, and I'm showing this because Peter Zanster is here, uh, I could have used you, Tim, as an example. Um, but this is the, uh, the technology where using a small molecule developed by Guy Savager in Montreal, uh, Peter, uh, together with Peter Zanstras, who built a, a special type of bioreactor to expand the cells, they now can take these cord blood stem cells, have a 30-fold expansion, and uh, have a single cord transplant uh, of one patient. And this is now in clinical trials and is looking very, very promising. Uh, and so by the numbers, we've leveraged over $100 million of partner support. Uh, we've, over the years, uh, in, from small to larger ways, been involved with the creation of, of 16 biotech companies. Uh, we've been involved in 18 clinical trials. Uh, in the last three years, we've not been part of the National Centers of Excellence, and so we've been allowed to fund clinical trials directly, and we're helping support um, clinical trials Tim is involved with, as well as others. Uh, but um, uh, this is a big part of what we do now, and many patents and so on have generated from this research. Um, when we began uh, in 2001, there was no other operation in Canada in this space, uh, and now there are many different groups helping support and move uh, stem cell research and regenerative medicine forward. In particular, uh, um, uh, the, the um, Center for Commercialization of Regenerative Medicine, um, uh, the, the Center for Drug Research and Development, who are in Vancouver. Uh, uh, we have Medicine by Design, the Ontario Institute of Regenerative Medicine, uh, TASEL, CELCAN, and BC Regen, REGMED. Uh, and uh, these groups have now come together, though, to uh, form what's called the Regenerative Medicine Alliance of Canada, where we are now working together, uh, coordinating uh, and more seamlessly to deliver our programs, share best practices, uh, uh, conduct training, and so on. So it's a very positive development. Uh, so looking to the future for the stem cell network, we want to continue strategic funding across the pipeline, continue the funding of the next generation of multidisciplinary investigators, we would like to build a clinical trials infrastructure to accelerate the pace of clinical trials in regenerative medicine uh, and continue through partnerships um, uh, to um, uh, move the science forward and uh, support commercialization and also uh, work internationally to represent Canada and also to partner. Uh, so that's where we're at. Thank you very much. There's got to be at least one question. I can ask myself a question. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about using stem cells in a step state as therapeutics because you're saying that stem cells can cause cancer um, often projected improperly. But how do you, in clinical research, how do you strike the balance between getting the benefits of stem cells in a stem cell state, state, state without? Okay. So um, I remember that all, not all stem cells are identical. Uh, the stem cells that can form a tumor are embryonic stem cells, right. and you would not transplant those directly. You would transplant their, the, the, the differentiated cells from them. Adult stem cells do not form tumors. Uh, they're well behaved, and, and uh, you know, bone marrow transplants have been done for a very, very long time, as well as, and more recently, other types of adult stem cell. Uh, work transplanting neural stem cells in the brain. Those don't form tumors and are very safe. Yes. Uh, I hope this isn't a bad question. But like, I was just thinking about uh, 
the challenges to make therapies accessible? And like, is there a challenge that these therapies and their implementation might only be available to those that have the means? Sorry. Great question, and no, it's not a bad question at all. So, uh, with you know the next generation of therapeutics, uh, especially those developed, let's say, in a biotech company, they can be exceptionally expensive. An example of this is the CAR T cell therapy for treating cancer. You know, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars for treatment. Um, uh, and so, so. Back to your point before about muscular dystrophy, and when you consider the prevalence of disability in muscle higher in the global south, where obviously those populations don't so, have So, that, yeah, so I, I'll, um, I'll speak to the larger question first, and then we can talk about muscular dystrophy. Right. So many of the things that the, uh, the stem cell network involved are, uh, are hospital-based procedures that don't involve companies. So it's changing clinical practice. So, uh, and so for example, um, the work done in Ottawa to treat MS patients is done within the, the, the existing practice plan. There's no change in the cost of the healthcare system. And um, uh, it's a, it's a hospital-based procedure. For other sorts of things, there will be a cost to the, to, um, the healthcare system. Uh, and uh, one of the things that we're uh, interested in implementing is bringing on board health economists to participate in the projects to look at those sorts of questions. Because ultimately, we need to be able to justify uh, the spend on the research in terms of whether or not there'll be uptake into the clinic and whether or not this, it's going to be reasonable for the payer, the healthcare systems in the provinces, in particular in Canada, uh, to start paying. Typically, however, um, what government looks at is the spend in the silo of the healthcare system. That uh, they don't look at the health economics argument that if you have someone who is going to die or have a debilitating disease who's no longer working, uh, and the, 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 the economic impacts of taking them out of the workforce, not paying taxes, uh, uh, the cost of, uh, it, it's, it's not just the cost of health care, there's knock-on effects on the family and so on. Uh, the kids don't get an education because the, 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 the parent isn't working. There's knock-on effects that are quite significant. Uh, if you cure someone of a disease and they're back in the workforce and so on, the health care system only counts the cost of health care delivery. It doesn't cost out those knock-on effects in the health economics argument. And so I think we also need to think about how we, we evaluate our cost to our society of someone with a disease uh, versus the cost of delivering health care, uh, if you follow me. Um, and the other question was around muscular dystrophy? Yeah, I, I guess you sort of answered both my questions. I guess it's just sort of really good to you to sort of thinking about the social the therapy down the track. Yeah, so we have a public health care system. There will not be people who, where, where, where if the payer is going to support, uh, let's say, CAR T therapy, it'll be available to everyone, not just the rich. Um, uh, but it, well, as we all know in a public health care system, sometimes there's slow to be uptake of, of these new and expensive technologies. Uh, they're not all necessarily going to be expensive, but uh, some of them might be. And that's why we need to do health economic studies along with the research to look at what is the true cost and the whole cost as well as cost to the to the healthcare system. But that's true for you know not just regenerative medicine; it's a across medicine. Yeah. Yes. Um, how did the clinical trial process for stem cells from a drug? That's a great question. Um, I'm not a clinician. Uh, there's, there's, uh, there might be uh, um, uh, other people in the room who are better at answering this than me. But it's been, uh, you know, the, the, the drug uh, system is well developed and mature. Um, uh, and um, uh, both the FDA in the United States and, and uh, the, the systems in Europe and, and uh, the Canadian system are very well experienced in how to handle uh, and look at drugs, toxicity, uh, uh, what the clinical trial design should look like and so on. Cell therapy is sort of with stem cells, especially in stem cell products, is an emerging area. Uh, and there's, um, Health Canada has been very receptive to uh, working with the community to understand what the emerging technologies are, 
uh, how it will be impacted by technologies like gene editing, and thinking about the regulatory framework and, and how that should evolve. Um, we've had, uh, this, uh, the Stem Cell Network has, has organized uh, many policy workshops which Health Canada has participated in, um, and there's also now uh, in the area of cell therapy, Health Canada has set up a, a, a committee that uh, the RMAC members are, are uh, participating in to look at these regulatory questions. Yes, yeah, I think so. Uh, they're, they're very interested in learning and, and adapting. And I would say, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Alan, but uh, I think they're, they're less rigid than, let's say, the FDA is. Yeah. I, I think also the, uh, Canada is also a great place to do clinical trials because of the common standard of care. So in the US, uh, you know, every jurisdiction, every hospital has a different, every HMO has a different standard of care. Uh, whereas uh, across the entire province, people are, uh, you know, health records are the same. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the treatments that they're being given are the same. Also, there is um, uh, this, um, the treatment that was received by um, that MS patient, um, they're having a hard time implementing that in the States because in Canada, uh, blood services, uh, the Red Cross, did the purifications of the hematopoietic stem cell for free. As, and they participated in the trial because that's their, their mandate. Uh, in, in the US, they have to find someone that has the technology and figure out how to pay for that. And uh, it's harder to make things work. Uh, so in the Canadian collaborative culture, we're able to get these things done in really interesting ways. To, and uh, that has been rolled out as a multi-site clinical trial. And certainly in Ottawa and Ontario, that's become the standard of care with these acute autoimmune disease situations. One last question. Um, I just maybe a little offensive for like, how, what's the sort of rate of like this for the MS patients? Because usually like there's one patient that actually succeed. Um, before, and about how many like participants are actually in the clinical trial? So um, uh, that's all been published, that work. Uh, I think it was, was it in the Lancet? I think so. Um, just recently, they did over 42 patients. So these are, are patients who have very, very progressive MS. That uh, in two years, they're going to die. So it's a small fraction of total MS patients. Most MS patients um, have attacks, and then they, they, they're in remission, and they, it comes and goes. Uh, as the disease progresses in a very slow way, these patients just go boom, down they go out, they're, and they're, they're uh, immobilized in a bed, and the disease is just rapidly racing through them. Um, uh, what, what this treatment does uh, is it reboots the immune system, uh, so they no longer have an autoimmune disease, and the body's regenerative um, processes can repair that damage. With Jennifer Molson, the patient I showed you, she was young. So her, she was able to repair that damage. Older patients uh, don't have that same regenerative ability, and they don't. They, 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 it's very stabilized. It just stops the progression, and they might get some. Uh, you know, their, their vision might improve. That kind of thing. But she went from because she was so young, she came right back and uh, has now skiing and dancing uh, at her and working. And yeah, it's a wonderful story. Well, doing an autologous bone marrow transplant requires a mild blade of chemotherapy, which is not something you'd want to do unless you have to. So these patients are, are going to die. It's like special permissions for... So the next step, though, is to mo uh, um, um, uh, modulate the immune uh, uh, response in those patients uh, without doing those sorts of uh, uh, conditions. And I think technologies and, and science is advancing so rapidly because of these new treatments for cancer, that um, it may be possible to do that sooner than we think. On that note, uh, I'd like to thank you for sharing the tremendous potential of stem cells for regenerative medicine and being very generous with your time. Thank you for coming out. Thank you.